Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back to my conversation series uh, all about uh, the concept of giving, creating, which can lead to healing, not only of others, but of thyself. Uh, we have a very, very, very special guest that we were very fortunate to get. Um, and we wanted to get her this month in particular because this is Suicide Prevention Awareness Month, September. I don't know if you knew that. Uh, and mental health awareness, as well as suicide prevention awareness, is very, 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 very important to me. And when we wanted to talk to someone, we decided we're going to try to find someone from the AFSP. And the very first person that we saw that we wanted to speak to, uh, Dion Monsanto. She's a yoga teacher, I believe a dance teacher, and a huge mental health advocate raising awareness. She works with the AFSP, she works with the AFSP New York City chapter, and uh, she also started the Seaway Project, a uh, specific mental health awareness um, and advocacy group within the global community of those of African descent to raise awareness and no shame in talking about it. Uh, she worked at J.P. Morgan and Morgan Stanley Financial Services for uh, about 20 years. And then about nine years ago, she suffered um, an unimaginable tragedy and uh, changed the course of her life. And that's some of the stuff we're going to address today. So uh, with that being said, let's welcome her on. Hello! Hello, how are you? Hi, Dion. Welcome! Thank you so much. How are you, Amir? I am, I just got goosebumps. I'm so excited. I'm like excited, nervous. Um, and I love the background. It's a lot of color and uh, it, I feel like inner life is outer life here. Yeah, yeah. I always say this is, um, you're basically in my kitchen workspace and it's called, I call my home Cafe 506. So I'm always making this magic in my kitchen, like my own kombucha and Florida water and vegan meals. And so welcome to Cafe 506. So, um, it's good to be in Cafe 506. I wish I had my coffee, but I just have my, um, <laughs> my, my sparkling water. We like sparkling water. We do. Water, right? Health, always. Physical Hydrated. health, sleep, always physical, sleep, family, friends. We're diving right in. Creative, yeah. all yeah. these things, all important for mental health. Yeah, absolutely. We must feed our body and feed our spirit and feed our mind. So, and water's a good start. So, good job. There's something we all can do, right? That's something yeah. everybody can do. Everybody can try to eat well, sleep well, and exercise. Start with those fundamentals, and you can take leaps and bounds with your mental health. That's true. That's true. And sometimes I think people think that it sounds too simple. Like going for a walk 30 minutes a day is life-saving and life-changing. Couldn't agree more. So, Couldn't agree more. So sometimes it's little. Having that, that water... Um, and a little more than you might want. And I'm, I'm an absolute fan of caffeine. I'm here for the black tea, green tea, here for coffee, it. Go, go for it. Just have water too. You know, I, I, um, I, I, I have a dog and it actually immensely helped my life besides the, and she's an emotional support uh, animal. And I have to walk my dog, which forces me to stop what I'm doing, get some fresh air, feed, make sure she's okay. And in turn, um, I feel better. Yeah. It's giving is receiving. And I had a, an older bio that I feel like I had in there. Um, I created a term for myself. I said I was a serial helper. You know, as you know, one of the things I do is teach yoga and dance. So I told my students today, because I did teach today um, at 12, I said, you know, I could be having a really cruddy day and you guys help me because I show up for you and you do the yoga and that helps me heal me. Whatever's going on in my life, it takes me out of my head and I'm connecting to another spirit. So that's, that's, what, this, that's what this conversation series is about. I started this to talk about how giving and creating can heal. Yes. And, if you be, and it can start with the simplest gesture. You can open the door for someone. Yeah. You yeah. can, and I know this is going to ring true. You can tutor someone. Yeah, definitely. definitely. You know, there's a lot of different things someone can do if they don't have money to donate, if they don't have time to work for the AFSP, there's always something you can do. You can take a dog for a walk, you know? You can call a loved one and say, you know, check in. There's so many things you can do that help thyself. Amir, you can smile. The energy shift is tangible. So the littlest thing you can do, and on a really bad day, I will honor and share that 
The smile might be so deep on the inside that it might not be possible to turn the corner of your lips up. There are days like that. Of course. But a smile does so much. You know, there's a psychological theory uh, called the facial feedback theory, mm. where if you smile, it triggers sort of, um, it stimulates certain sort of neural pathways oh, that yeah. then create a happiness, that then create a smile and create, it's like a sort of like a, a chicken and egg theory. That's, I mean, wow. it's one theory, it's called the facial feedback theory. The, I didn't even the know that. Facial feedback theory, yeah, so. I gotta look that up. Okay, so let's uh, dive in uh, a little bit about uh, you. Okay. Um, a little bit, I told them a little bit about your uh, history. You worked at, mm -hmm. you were born in New York and worked yep. at NSP, AFSP New York, and then you also yep. started the, the Seaway Project with someone. Yeah. Yep. And, um, and worked in financial services and have two okay. sons. Mm -hmm. You also had someone very, very special. Yes. And yes. Um, I, I don't want to speak ahead of turn, well, but you lost her and then yes. you changed the direction of your life. Yes. That's kind yes. of what I want to talk about. So we'll start there. What can you tell us um, about uh, you, your sons, and Seaway mm -hmm. um, prior to nine years ago? So I'm a mom. I take great pride in being a mom. I feel like it's a really important job for me and it transformed me. I was an extremely naive person. I think I bought the Brooklyn Bridge like three times. And, um, and I, had to, I got a little more, more grounded as an adult when I started parenting. So I had a son and then I had a daughter and then I brought in another son. And um, they were all pretty amazing and individual and different. So my oldest son is doing amazing things in New York City as an artist. He called me yesterday. He had a meeting at Sotheby's and he's got an artist residency at the Noma Hotel. Yeah, he's doing amazing. Yeah, exactly that, exactly that. That was me on the phone. Um, my daughter, dancer, singer, writer, um, played violin, cello, um, so acoustic guitar, bass guitar, dance with Ailey. Um, was ink published in English and Spanish, had met with Hachette, Hachette Publishing, before she was 14, about a book she had written about 17 chapters of. Um, then my youngest son, a dancer. She had, also, she had also written a children's book that is published. That is, it's finished and it's not published. And it's funny you say that because I have it on a hard drive that I'm taking to someone on Friday to get it off of that so we can get it published. Because the conversation we were having with a friend who's an illustrator, and that's the thing that I, my, in my hope before the 10th anniversary of her passing, I would like the children's book to be published because she was truly passionate about kids. And had literally volunteered at her elementary school and a library before she, a week, less than a week before she passed because that was her thing. And her short life of 15 years, mm -hmm. I don't even know her and I'm completely moved by her. She did so much, she does more than most people do in a 100 year life. Yeah, yeah. One it's, of the things that blew me away is that she was tutoring math at the age of seven. That's right. That's at right. the age of seven and that she was written a book and was finishing another book less than the age of 15. Right, right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm the, I haven't started one and I'm 15 years old, right? So, you know, uh, yeah. <laughs> but one of the challenges about someone being so amazingly beautiful and brilliant and talented, quite often there are some mental health diagnoses and challenges that make it hard to live and thrive in the world as it is today. So she did live with depression and anxiety disorder. and Diagnosed at nine years old, correct? Yes. Exactly. I love how good you are not only a conversationalist, but you are a good researcher. So yes, she was diagnosed at nine years old and uh, still went on to thrive and do amazing things after that. And she unfortunately did die by her own hand at the age of 15. And that changed the trajectory of all of our lives. Um, as you know, and to our beautiful audience, thank you for listening. I was in financial services between two different companies, Morgan Stanley and JP Morgan Chase both amazingly supportive because I got married, had a baby and divorced and she died all within my time of working in financial services. And while people think of New York and financial services as dog eat dog, they were amazingly supportive to me, my family. Um, so my children are with me. I'm actually looking, I have pictures up if you want, like I can, I have like pictures here. I can show you pictures, but I don't know if that's overwhelming for people, but I love looking at pictures. Well, I've seen pictures of Seaway and she's on the cover of the Seaway Project website. I've seen that last selfie you guys took. 
Well, there I, I've got fun pictures, and this is a fun one that I have. Of the wrinkle hot mess because I use it so much. And because she was the queen of photoshopping things, that's what she did. And the little Devon Lake hair face with the, you know, given attitude always uh, is her. So I have butterflies. I have a butterfly tattoo because I always called her my little black butterfly because she was in the process of transformation. And uh, what I didn't realize about butterflies, always children make you learn, is that they have a short lifespan. So in her moving through and capturing life so quickly, I felt as though that was her spirit, her energy, letting me know like butterflies come and go really quick. We come in one way, we transform, we become something else. And she was complete in a way that I wish she was not complete at 15. And my grandmother, what you exactly said, Amir, my grandmother said at her memorial, she goes, she kept looking around the room because there were like over 300 people in a space that I'm not going to say where it was because we exceeded fire marshal capacity and kind of got in trouble. So we're not going to get that organization in trouble for that. She touched more lives than people do that live three times as long. And I'm, I'm glad you remembered the tutoring because she was passionate about that. Um, Chadwick Boseman, rest in peace. Uh, for those who are seeing this, he just passed a couple weeks ago. <sighs> and, and I've been reading quotes of this and knowing that he was sick for all those years mm -hmm. that he was doing those remarkable roles, literally changing the face of representation and, and, and so much more. One of the quotes he, he, he mentioned about find your purpose. Doesn't matter if there's a struggle. If you find your purpose, your vocation, and so forth, and it seemed like that's why I see. I think he was at peace. I'm, I'm guessing. Yeah. He had found his purpose. Yeah. And and I think I hope it's okay. I say this. Yeah. That Seaway found her purpose. Right. 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 In that in her short life, she found found her purpose. And I know people, uh, someone very close to me, who, who who are depressed because they can't find that purpose. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, think, yeah. I appreciate you saying that. I appreciate the fact that you only know her through research and you can see that. Um, it's still something. And for you. I and think for you. It, thank you. And for you. I think because of her and me transforming my life, that's one of the gifts that I like to give through yoga and dance and speaking and really help connect people to their joy. And side note, my mother's a psychiatrist. Okay. Side note completely here. I've been such an advocate by being of my mother because she was a psychiatrist, learning and knowing about how important mental health advocacy yeah. and psychiatry is. And yeah. when someone yeah. might even be a candidate for medication is when they may not be able to function in their job right. as a husband or a wife or daughter or in school. And, and I always knew that, mm. but still was like, but I'm good. People like me, I'm happy. I do well in work that some people want to like say, oh, that's the reason so-and-so yeah, died. No. Or that's, that's the trigger. Now triggers are very powerful and yeah. very damaging, but there can be an underlying mental health issue that does not come from motherhood, abuse or anything. You, it is, you can have a blessed life a yeah. perfect blessed life and still want to want to die sorry i tangentialized on that a little bit back to what uh you were saying. no but i get it and i understand i say because i i am not currently in therapy i'm a big fan of therapy and um and i'll also put out there there are also reasons that people that might be interested in therapy don't access it because they don't feel like they'll be understood they won't be heard they won't be seen they don't have health care um, they can't afford the copay. There's there's all sorts of things like that as well. I do think we have a mental health crisis in New York City. Specific a, a crisis. Not enough psychiatrists. Not enough quality psychiatrists or therapists or psychologists mm -hmm. that can that can be accessed. I have I have privilege. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of privilege. Mm -hmm. I have great insurance. Yeah. I have great income. I have great family. I have a psychiatrist in my family, and I couldn't find a doctor in my when I needed one most. Wow. Through my insurance, anywhere I was calling, I was getting record. Oh, this doesn't. Oh, this is a uh, this is a uh, this is a heart doctor. Or this is a this. Oh, I'm not taking new patients. Messages, not returning calls until I actually had to pull onto my good fortune and get recommended of somebody who wasn't seeing new patients who took me on that wasn't in my insurance and I was lucky enough to afford it. Mm -hmm. I am aware of how my health has been. And, and that was and that was hard. Can you imagine? Yeah, of course. I, I can only imagine, you know, 
So uh, that, I, I, I couldn't agree more of the, the number of reasons of why people, and then of course there's something that I know you started with the Seaway Project called No Shame Day, and then people don't want to see health because of the shame. Yeah. They yeah. think it's shameful, they think they should snap out of it because it's such a misunderstood disease. I'm glad you mentioned No Shame Day because it's important to end stigma that we all have conversations without shame. Not everybody even knows the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist. Dane, would you tell us? Share a with psychologist. Us. don't know. A psychologist does not prescribe medication, so medication, so it would be talk therapy. And a psychiatrist can prescribe medication and also provide talk therapy. So sometimes people see both. So my daughter was one who had both. And, um, and then medication management is really important. Sometimes people think, oh, they're going to write me a pill like we take Tylenol and I'm going to be good, done. But the first medication might not be the right one. The first dosage might not be the right one. And um, Bossy, we haven't mentioned her. So Bossy Ikpi is my good, wonderful, dear friend that started the Seaway Project because she knew her. And she did ask me within the first six months that she passed if she could start a nonprofit in her name. And I said, yes. And she wanted me to be a part of it. And at that point, I was like, I do not have the capacity. And then later on, I came on board with her, specifically for those not having heard of it, the Seaway Project. It's a global nonprofit specifically to end stigma and bring awareness to mental health, awareness, mental health illness and diagnoses to the African diaspora. Because it, um, that level of grief and loss is something we always live with. So some people are like, oh, I didn't know what to say to you after Seaway died. And I was like, well, a lot of us don't know what to say. America doesn't have really good rituals around grief and loss. The turnaround so is- like, true, that is yeah. so true. It's like, oh, they died six months ago. You should be fine by now. No, no, no. It's like, you're still, what, you're still grieving? You know, you get the faces. It's like, oh, like there's something wrong for you for still feeling that loss. I have good days and I have really bad days. Um, I think I told you about her Elmo. Like I have the Elmo stays in bed with me. Elmo's on the bed. Like, I, I can't, my, my mom's one biggest vulnerability. She says, I could deal with anything in the world except anything happening to my son or my daughter. And, um, yeah. I, you know, that, that yeah. it's one of the reasons I wanted to speak to you is how you were able to, and I don't say overcome because it's not something one, yeah. I imagine one can ever overcome, but one deal with, process, yeah. and help others. That's, that's one of the, yeah. the things. I want to go to two things you said, though. There are 800,000 suicides yeah. a year globally. And yes. 47,000 a year in the US. That's right. And 90% are treatable. That's right. That's right. That's Think right. about that. Yeah, because the 800,000 deaths by suicide does not include the people that who attempt. You know, when we talk about the 90% are treatable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there are 10% that are untreatable. Right. I understand, and tell me if I'm incorrect. Your daughter was under suicide watch for a yeah. long time and had people around her. Yeah. And still found a way. And we never talk about the way. I learned this from you because it's like you don't you never talk about the method because that's right. what's that term? Suicide it, it, It's triggering. It's not safe messaging. So in terms of safe messaging, we don't want to because we're over um, we have access to too much information right now. I agree. Right? Um, oh my God, that reminds me, there's a documentary that just said right now, since 2008 and the advent of social media, from 2008 to now, young people's suicide rate has gone up 140%. Yeah. From 2008 to 2020, 140%. And I think it definitely has to do with both online bullying, overstimulation, yeah. and so forth. But that even under suicide watch, yes. some people will find a way. And that, it, but at the same time, there's also, this is a complicated area. There's a few things. There are triggers. So when you have underlying conditions yes. and triggers, that is a perfect <clears throat> storm. Seaway had triggers yes. as well as the underlying condition yes. and the ability to not save someone yes. no matter how much you do. I would like to hear about that in the bit of time we have left. What I would say about the 10%, I want to reframe it. And I, instead of saying they're not treatable, I would say we may not have the awareness yet because something that we do is research, right? We may not have the medication to respond to their specific needs. Yet, you yes. know, it's coming. But if we take the time and have advocate using our tax dollars with our elected officials for research to happen in these areas in the future, I don't know that there will be a 10%. I think there'll be access for it because we'll understand 
if you're born within you know a certain thing if the shape of your brain if there's something there'll be a marker autism has early markers now there are no early markers yet for us to say oh we should watch people like this if testosterone hits this level if this the physical um your physical checkup they need to ask there's a word for it the dm something your mom would know there's a three-letter thing that you ask about and if you get four or more five of those markers or more you know you're sort of depressed and you should get support for that all of these things would be normal whether you're going to gyn whether you're going to your regular um physician for a checkup to get that so yes Seaway had triggers. Seaway lived with depression and anxiety disorder. Seaway might have had PMDD, premenstrual diphoric disorder. Oh, yeah. It is okay. like PMS on steroids. Yep. So people talk all about PMS. All, all get flipped out upside down. Because ev- she had multiple suicide attempts, which some people may or not be aware of. Um, and every suicide attempt was around the type of, time of her cycle, her menstrual cycle. So the hormonal change is something that triggered her. When she died in 2011, they were not diagnosing teenagers with bipolar disorder. So now they diagnose children younger. Things have changed with the research through the forensics and talking about how she was. They say she probably did have bipolar 2 disorder. People have heard of bipolar or bipolar 2 disorder, but they don't know, like everything, there are levels. You know, you can have diabetes, but then it's which, you know, diabetes 1, diabetes 2, hepatitis A, B, or C. There's different levels. So you just have to learn more. So I would dare say what we know now is different than what we know then. I'm going to hope and believe and pray. And yeah, that's another thing. But then you talk about African diaspora and prayers. Prayers are wonderful, but you still, you break a leg, you pray, and you go to the hospital. So you have mental health issues, you pray and go see the doctor. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you. They're not mutually exclusive. I'm so sad that more people don't know that or don't believe in that. Right, right. And one of the things that something else when you talk about the African diaspora and just globally, there are still a number of countries and places where suicide is a crime. So people, the stigma not only comes out of shame within your family, but if it's illegal, instead of telling somebody you're having suicidal ideations, you're having suicidal thoughts, you don't want to tell anybody because you don't want to go to jail. Because if you're thinking about killing another person, that's premeditated, right? And you're going to be in custody. So instead of getting that person mental health support, they wind up going to prison. And one of the places you know that I go to regularly is Kenya, and it's still illegal in Kenya. And it used to be illegal here. But even the term, the fact that we say someone committed suicide comes out of the fact that it used to be a crime. It's an attempted suicide and they fail, then they go to jail? Yeah. Yeah, they they wind up- possible place for them to go there's no rehabilitation there's no support there's no therapy so i'm not sure there are bills in place and i do know one of the um one of the elected officials there that's been working on it a lot of it is um a lot of it is volunteer based because the insurance system is also very privileged there so people can't afford to get care even if they know they need care Um, some tribes some cultures they can't talk about that person anymore that creates another trauma for the family I think it's amazing that, you know, when you started with the AFSP and then you sort of narrowed in and focused, you know, with Seaway Project and the African diaspora, why do you think in your experience um, it's important, and I want to speak specifically in this country, because we're both Americans, why in the African-American community um, mental health and suicide is not spoken of or treated as much, say, maybe in the white community, for lack of a better word? It needs addressing in all communities, Absolutely. but specific, specific in the African diaspora. Um, just to state, looking at where 2020 is and what has happened to people of color, black men and women specifically, uh, trans, straight, everything in between, it's important to take note that historically, you know, we as a people have been told to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, that we have to do better and be more to receive less there's still a feeling and it's in the DNA of you can't let somebody see there's something wrong with you. And this is perceived as something wrong with you. Unfortunately, we need to get to the point where we and every culture, but specifically um, folks of African descent, understand that it's something that's different with the brain. 
in the same way, if you break a leg, you break an arm, you have, have diabetes, you have cancer, these are all things you go get support with. And the form and function of brains that have mental illness are different. So your brain needs to go see a doctor that specializes in that. One of the things my mom always did before was take a full medical history. Medical history in your family, it can run in family, your thyroid levels, your first thing my psychiatrist checked was my vitamin D, which was oh, like, yes. yeah. I was sleeping so late and like I wasn't getting in the sun in New York City and seasonal depression. There are so many things, sleep, fitness, there's so many things to check and so forth. And then, th and then I think it's also, I, I wish that there are more psychiatrists and therapists that were within one because sometimes all the information you share with the psychiatrist who just checks your, your levels and say, are you okay? And then you talk about the things they sometimes need to be in conjunction because what's right. a trigger versus what's an underlying condition. And it's a very complicated dance. Another reason why I think in this country and around the world, we have such, um, such issues with understanding and treating mental health. I think because there's so much shame and stigma around it. When my daughter passed, June 29th, 2011, I was still employed at Morgan Stanley. And I remember telling a friend and she called me up maybe a day or two after, I don't recall. That some, so a lot of the year is a blur. But she called me up and she goes, Dion, and she's whispering. I won't whisper so you can hear me. But she goes, Dion, I, Tony, I told Tony that Seaway died and he asked me what happened and I didn't know what to tell him. And I said to her, she took her life. And she goes, I can tell him that. And I was like, what else am I gonna tell people? I do not have the capacity to make up a lie about how my daughter passed. This is the truth of what happened. This is the truth of her, you know, how she died. So I can do nothing but tell the truth and we can learn it. and heal. For your yeah. own, you have to remain authentic. I took great pride in the 15 years that I had with her and how much I learned from her. So I want to share those lessons with others. And I want other parents and siblings and grandparents and cousins to know it's not their fault, to learn talk, mood, and behavior. What are some of the signs? Uh, Harry Lennox said to me, he said, what's wrong, Amir? This was early on before I had therapy, their, uh, their uh, psychiatrist. And I said, I didn't couldn't sleep last night. And he goes, why not? I said, eh, anxiety. He goes, anxiety, it's a smart people's disease. Wow. Good, good one, Harry. That's, I'll have to remember that a smart part. Yeah. Cause she definitely at nine, the same time when she was diagnosed, there's certain levels when you're testing without doing the IQ, just the generic testing and whatever that highest level is. So that's what she got there. Uh, my uncle, this is a, it, the irony of, real quick is I think I mentioned to you, my uncle committed suicide. So at a, the age of eight, I was like destroyed and I was only eight, but his IQ was off the charts, like a genius, but he didn't take care of himself. Mm -hmm. But here's the irony. And I, I think you can relate to this possibly is my mom is a psychiatrist and my mom is like a, a, a genius mm -hmm. and yet she couldn't save her brother. Right. And you are an amazing mom and people need to know yes. that. Yeah, it's, it's not their fault. I generally tell people, and that's one of the talks that you saw, um, I'm a good mother and I still lost my daughter to suicide and we're all healing and we have ups and we have downs. And as I said to you, I cannot imagine how challenging it is for your mom with that awareness and how that changed the trajectory of her life. From her death, I learned to live. I learned to make time for me, to smile, to sleep, to eat, to drink, to cry. So I had to learn more and understand that it wasn't my fault. I did everything I could do with the information I had. And if I could help others, then I can help me. And you, you know, there's a, there's a training that I do with, the, with AFSP, with the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. It's called Talk Saves Lives. And yeah. within Talk Saves Lives, um, there's, there's a sheet where we talk about, you have to close your eyes and imagine the greatest pain that you've ever been in physically, whatever that is for you. Broken leg, broken arm, childbirth, whatever that thing, you have to come to a point where you can really feel and visualize in your mind and body what it was, what it was to be in excruciating physical pain. And then try to imagine making a thought, signing a lease, giving someone directions to oh, your- Oh, wow, that's good. You can't. 
that is the pain that the person that chooses, that, that, that ends their life, that takes their life, that dies by suicide, that's the pain that they're living in on a daily basis. So it's not that the person that dies by suicide or attempts wants to die, they want to end the relief. pain. They, they just want relief. I would say that it's, that is a great way to explain it to the layman who may not understand it. And then I would say, once they have that comprehension, it's that and then some. Right. And then some, where they can't even overcome their love for their loved ones. I'm always engaging in the conversation. I have on my little butterfly pin because Seaway was my little black butterfly. Can stand up? And we can't see it a little more? A little, there, there it is. Yep, there my it mom is. gave me that, my butterfly with um, that, you know, with all the birthstones in it that my mom gave me for my 50th birthday. And um, we're all in a process of growth and transformation. If you're in therapy at five, be in therapy at five. And if you don't need therapy until you're 45, be in therapy at 45. If you need medication, be on medication. If that first one doesn't work, you know, people go to the store and try on a pair of jeans and they don't fit right and they try on a different pair of jeans. You try a doctor and it's not the right fit. Yes. Try a doctor. Yes. Yes. We went through there several doctors before we found the right one. Yes. There are so many factors. It is a human being is not a living stasis. It is a moving particles, our break, our, we're growing, our hormones, our health, our age, our height, our weight, our, our race, our genetic history, our changing things, our triggers, our environment, our family. I mean, this is a complicated thing and it's not something yeah. you just heal. Yeah. It is something you, you don't just heal diabetes. You take insulin for the rest yeah. of your life. You That's take right. heart medication for the rest of your life. You have a vitamin D deficiency. You take it for the rest. You get therapy. And yeah. also on top of that, I encourage everybody, it's everyone's good for mental health. As simple as take a walk, drink a lot of water, get your sleep, eat right. When I realized that I needed help and I really admitted it to myself, I said, well, if I'm going to do that, I better take full responsibility on what I can control. Right. I can really address my sleep, my eating, right. what, what personal responsibility. And if yeah. you are so, for lack of a better word, sick in your mind, then hopefully a loved one will catch it or you reach a loved one to help you with that responsibility. Now, Oh my God. Now yeah. I've got to cut you off because that's yeah. something to say for all of you with loved ones, the loved ones, you have to, we have to shore ourselves up to be able to go, Amir, I'm concerned about you. You haven't been yourself lately. We're all in it together and that you have really, you're taking shape and using your platform to be in service. Not only to yourself, but to others. Before yeah. we finish, I just want to get into one more thing with you. Yeah, yeah. Um, that we haven't talked about and how you changed the direction of your life. And mm. UA helped you find this new direction of your, living your authentic life, yes. sleeping, smiling. Yes. But specifically, a big thing for me, too, on top of mental health awareness, is the ability to do art and yes. to give that helps to heal. So let's talk about, I want to talk about, let, we've talked so much about getting awareness and getting people to realize this is a real thing and to get help. But how you helped yourself, now, I'm not even talking about therapy or bereavement groups. I'm okay. talking about the yoga and the arts that you have been participating. So I've been on stage, and, as has Seaway. So I've been on stage since I was five. So I've been in theater, on stage, acting and dancing since I was five years old. And getting back into the arts, because at some point when you become an adult and you buy a house and you have a job and you have the kids and you have a tenant and you have a car, you don't play. So theater is a level of play that I love and getting back into theater and dance and yoga was a big part of the healing for me. I created a healing cocktail for myself of the things that I loved. I got up and went to yoga. The day before Seaway passed, I was in the 6.30 a.m. class. The day after she passed, I went to yoga again. Amazing. And my partner, he was like, he's like, what's wrong? And he, I was like, I want to go to yoga. He goes, go to yoga. And I was like, but we have to go to the funeral home. We can go to the funeral home after you go to yoga. Really? I can go? Yeah, go. Day of her burial. You know, all that time, making time for me every time. People were in my house. I am in a three-bedroom house here in Washington Heights, and people were constantly here with me being in theater, her being in theater, her being in dance, creating time for myself. I Leaving and going to yoga was the best thing for me because there were no questions. There was no why. There was no cell phone ringing. 
There was no home did phone. I, did I hear? Did I did I read or, or or hear you say this once that one of the only places of relief since her passing, when in the beginning process of your grief, was actually yoga and meditation. That's right. It was one of the few places you could Absolutely. actually. And you know what's so funny that people don't Absolutely. realize it's actually breathing and releasing your mind from yes. control and from all those things. Just being on my mat, I was like, this little six foot by three foot thing was an oasis and a magic carpet where I was just with me. It's so funny. I just, I just now in my life started getting into it, meditating. And, and I didn't have the ability when I was younger to properly meditate. I tried it. I was like, it's not for me. It's not for me. Suddenly it's like, oh, I, can, I, I feel like it's because I'm sliding into my purpose. But there's so many apps. I'm going to tell everybody, get all the free, get a free app, get a free app. Mindfulness, yeah. I'm not at calm, shine. I think I have two or three on my phone. Find something on YouTube, press play. And even if you fall asleep, that's what you need it. So it's yoga and meditation and then dance. Because I, I love dance. Do you, do you choreograph? Do you do? You, I do you, both. I, I, I don't oh, choreograph yeah. as much anymore. So I've mostly been on stage with other dance companies. But in Kenya, I think I did... I choreographed two dance videos and performed in them and yeah. the making of them and teaching. Have you ever, do you ever feel uh, that you channel Seaway sometimes through your dance or that it's an expression of her? Or do you find that, and there's no right answer to this, obviously, or do you find that it's actually a release where you're just in the moment with, 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 with yourself and your spirit? When I glad, I'm glad, I love that you touched on that because in my, one of my dance bios, I said, dance is not something that I do. It's how spirit shows up through me. It's something that I channel. So, Totally. I, it's, it's something when I do modern, cause modern wasn't my thing. Um, and that's something that she loved. I'm like, oh, this is so serious. Like, all right, fine. I'm going to do this thing. That, this is your thing, girl. Not my thing. But um, my passion now is African dance. And that was also because of the kids, cause they could go with me and we would dance together and um, my son would drum and then she would dance. And it was just this family thing of connection. And uh, every, everybody's been on stage at some point, your inner child has to live. Exactly. And then you got to laugh so you don't cry. And when that. you do cry, that's okay because water is healing at every level. Oh, boom. Okay, so we, we have to wrap up. I think that's a perfect place to end on, but there's one last thing I would like people to end on that is something I read that really, really touched me. Something, that, something tangible that people can do no matter where mm -hmm. they are in their mental health, healthy not, is I saw something on the Seaway Project she was 15 years old and something about 15 acts of kindness. 15. Oh my God. So let's, 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 let, can you just tell us a little bit about that yeah. and we'll end on that. Okay. So one, something that I do that I always want to cherish and honor um, our dead, specifically my Seaway. And because she lives for 15 years, my request every year, generally on her birthday, is that people go out and do things for others. If I don't ask for it on the day, she was born, I asked for it on the day she died. And I was like, 15, whether you giving, so sometimes people, there are people that have given $15 or $30, they'll do something so they'll give money or 15 acts of kindness. And so people have says like, I did it, I opened doors, I smiled, you know, you pay for something at, um, you pay for a toll, then you pay for the toll for the person behind you and you pay- I love toll. this so, so much. Yeah, 15 acts of kindness. Um, and sometimes I would say, sit down for 15 minutes. If you don't know how to fit meditate, turn your phone off, turn the TV off and sit still, set a timer for 15 minutes and be with yourself and your thoughts. Journal for 15 minutes, but 15. Okay, so can we say, all right, so for those that are watching this, uh, thank you for watching. Uh, we have an assignment for you. And on this day, this is the day you saw this, please, come on, you can do it, do 15 something. 15 acts of kindness, 15 minutes with yourself. Yeah. Something 15 that yeah. is not about anything other than giving and healing. You can do it, everybody. 15, yeah. 15 yeah. minutes. What are you going to do for 15 today? For 15, um, you know what I'm going to do? because this has been on my list and I haven't done it. I am going to take a bath. It's gonna be a bubble bath and we'll stay in there without doing other stuff and making lists for at least 15 minutes. So I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna take a bath, a bubble bath. That is a great one. I, what am I- What are you gonna do? I'm going to take my dog to the dog park, oh. which I do often. 
but she loves to play fetch. And I am gonna go throw that tennis ball across the full dog park to get her full run 15 times. Yes, yeah, and what's your dog's name? And look who's here, right on cue. Raina, come say hi, come say hi. Right on cue, her name is Raina. Hey, Raina. Say hi. Hey, Raina. Raina, you're gonna have fun today. You're gonna have fun. You know you're what you're doing? <laughs> A little therapy dog, little love. All right, so we can't thank you enough. On our way out, how can people, how can people um, uh, find you? Read about the Seaway uh, Project, AFSP, or in the New York City chapter. Let us yeah. know any social media handles. Okay. That you give. So here we go. AFSP NYC. That's on all social media. My name, Dion C. Monsanto on Instagram. If you look up Dion Monsanto, you'll find me under Joyous Ocean on Twitter. Um, I am a joyous ocean. I love the theme of water and joy, and that's who I am. If you find AFSP NYC, I'm there doing videos and talks and teaching yoga, all the things that I love to help myself heal and others heal. Uh, the Seaway Project, T-H-E-S-I-W-E Project, The Seaway Project. Um, and we're on all forms of social media. So find us, let's play, let's heal. Thank you so much. This Thank was you, Amir. Amazing. I learned so much. I had such a good time. Yeah, Thank it you. was. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Bye, Reina. Bye. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Ciao.